Merci beaucoup de nous avoir... Thank you very much for being here today. I am David Malone. It's a pleasure for me to work in this institution. It's the 40th anniversary of IDRC. It's gone by in a blink institution-like. But uh, we thought this year we'd invite to Canada, not just to Ottawa, but some other centers, um, people who can educate us in Canada, inspire us to think new thoughts, um, not narrowly on development, but the organization of society in other countries, uh, how economy interacts with politics, how all of these, of course, derive from history. And I could think of no one better of my personal acquaintance in India than Ramachandra Guha to come and uh, join us in this anniversary year. He's an extraordinary figure in his uh, own country. He's one of the leading public intellectuals of India. And as he reminded me yesterday in Montreal, he's an in entirely a product of Indian education. Um, he uh, did his college level studies at St. Stephen's College of Delhi University, perhaps the elite college of India. He moved on to do a master's at the uh, truly great, particularly then, Delhi School of Economics. And he did his PhD at one of India's famous IIMs. And he did it in sociology, touching also on environmental uh, studies. He's had quite a varied career as a writer, although he is, above all, a historian. Uh, he wrote about uh, the environment uh, in India. He wrote a book uh, he's very well known for in India on cricket. Uh, and his, I think fair, it's fair to say, his masterpiece came out three years ago, or his masterpiece to date, there will probably be others, uh, India After Gandhi, a truly thrilling history of India since independence. It's unputdownable if you pick it up, partly because Indian history since independence is so fascinating, and partly because he's a great writer and he carries the reader uh, along with him. Um, uh, we're very uh, privileged to have him in Canada. We were in Montreal yesterday. We'll be going to Toronto and uh, Vancouver next week. Uh, Ram, thank you so much for being with us. Um, Ram is suffering a bit from laryngitis, so we'll see how his voice holds out. And I know you'll forgive him if we have to bring this to a close a bit quicker than we, he would like or I would like, but it's in the interests of saving his voice uh, for other engagements. Ram, the podium is yours. Thank you, David, and thank you all for coming here. Laryngitis is also known as too much bullshitting syndrome. <laughs> <coughs> when I was working <coughs> on the book David mentioned, India After Gandhi, I found uh, in the course of my research that from the time India uh, came into being as an independent nation in August 1947, right up till the early 1990s, uh, this experiment with nationhood and democracy was being written off. Very many obituaries were written about India. It was said uh, that uh, it was too diverse to be run as a single nation, so it would balkanize into many parts. It was said that uh, <coughs> it was too poor and uh, full of too many illiterate people to function as a democracy, so the military would take over. It was said uh, uh, that uh, it lacked the ability to feed itself, so it would face mass uh, starvation and famine. S uh, and I didn't really <coughs> uh, uh, understand <coughs> until I started working on this book what a, <coughs> what a miracle the survival of India is and how uh, these fears... Uh, uh, were 
justified because never before had a country so diverse in terms of religion and language been constituted as a single nation. Never before had a population, uh, the majority of which could not read or write, been granted <coughs> uh, uh, the franchise to elect their own leaders. Now, towards the end of the period I was working on the book, the book took a very long time to write. India is a large country. Uh, it's a complicated history. Um, uh, for several years, <coughs> the book was traveling in my computer under the fine name, Mythical History Book, because I wasn't sure that I'd ever complete it. Uh, so it took, uh, the publisher was very indulgent as I missed deadline after deadline. But uh, towards the end of the period I was writing the book, uh, uh, finishing the book, I found uh, that in the press, uh, very different kinds of songs were being sung about India. My research told me that for most of our history as an independent nation, we were being told, you're going down the tube. Uh, but when I was finishing the book in 2005 and 2006, the Western press was telling us, you guys are the new stars of the future. And uh, I, uh, the, my talk today is um, an attempt to resolve that contradiction, if you will, or attempt to explain that contradiction. <coughs> now, the reason <coughs> that India was written off at birth and for many years afterwards this was precisely because of the uniqueness and indeed the recklessness of the Indian political experiment. The reason that uh, more recently uh, India is being talked about as a rising global power is due uh, to two things. To its political success in staying united and in holding regular free and fair elections. Every election in India is the largest exercise of the democratic franchise in human history simply because there's so many of us. Uh, and we've done it 15 times. Uh, which is quite staggering at the national level. And of course, there are countless state and provincial and district elections. And uh, I must say, uh, especially in the context of what happened in Florida, Florida in 2000, I think Indian elections are as fair as, or as, uh, uh, <coughs> almost as fair as elections held anywhere in the so-called developing world. So one of the reasons um, uh, that there was a surprising respect for uh, India in, uh, in kind of the global discourse was its politi counter-intuitive political success in staying united and staying democratic. The other and possibly more important reason <coughs> was the spectacular uh, growth rates of the economy experienced especially in, from the 1990s onwards. Uh, growth rates touching 7 and 8 percent, which are much higher than that those experienced in, in Europe and North America. Uh, the global recession, India seems to have come out of it as well. So really, we're talking about two statistics. A nation of a billion people, uh, half of which is Ill, uh, whom are illiterate, holding free, fair, and regular elections. Unique in the history of Asia and Africa, at least. Um, a largely poor agrarian country with a history of being colonized, uh, suddenly uh, emerging out of a low-level uh, growth path, to achieve growth rates of 8% or more. Now, Aldous Huxley, uh, the British writer, who visited India uh, while we were still a colony in the late 1920s, and wrote a charming book about it called Jesting Pilot. Uh, uh, one of the places he visited was the Taj Mahal. And he said, uh, about the Taj Mahal, he said, marble I see conceals a multitude of sins. And uh, those two figures, 15 gender elections for a billion people, a decade and a half of 8% growth rates, conceal a multitude of deficiencies. And that's uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today. The deep fault lines within Indian society that are sometimes invisible even to Indians. <coughs> and the fault line I'm going to start with, because it, in a sense, uh, underlines the imperfections of our democracy, and the fragility of our economic growth path. The first fault line uh, I'm going to talk about is a rising insurgency in central India, among, uh, led by Maoist revolutionaries. The Republic of China has abandoned Mao, but they are a group of very committed, uh, uh, idealistic, almost fanatical young men and women 
who in the forests and hills of central and eastern India are attempting to create a one-party communist dictatorship. And they've achieved a modest degree of success. Uh, earlier this week, 72 policemen were killed in a daring attack by the Maoist insurgents. It was the largest loss of non combatant uh, you know, troops uh, in the history of independent India. Um, across a wide swathe of forests and hills, uh, uh, you know, which spread across the states uh, of, Gujarat, of uh, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, Orissa, Jharkhand, and Chhattisgarh, right in the heart of India, you have a growing Maoist insurgency. And this Maoist insurgency has its roots <coughs> in the dispossession of India's tribal people. Now, uh, for the first four decades of Indian independence, our economic model was one of the state or the public se sector occupying the commanding heights of the economy. In the early 1990s, we liberalized. We uh, embraced a more outward uh, economic policy which gave much freer play to entrepreneurial uh, energies within India and also integrated India much more actively into the global economy. Uh, uh, in the past, we had followed <coughs> the classical uh, path of uh, emerging developing economies of what was called import substituting industrialization. Now, this was overturned and we became increasingly globalized. Now, in my view, uh, globalization has had both benign and brutal effects in India. The benign effects uh, of globalization are manif manifest most directly and immediately in my hometown, Bangalore, where uh, the fact uh, that uh, we have opened out to the world economy and the happy accident that we are 10 hours behind North America has allowed us to leverage a skilled workforce. Bangalore has a long tradition of high quality science and engineering colleges. And the graduates of these colleges have powered the information technology industry, uh, uh, you know, uh, which is increasingly the back office of many major companies in the world, uh, which uh, maintain the accounts, uh, the office systems. Uh, we also have a rising uh, a market for health services, so that medical transcriptions are read in Bangalore or in South India <coughs> eight or 10 hours uh, ahead of America, and by the time North America and Europe wakes up, the reports are there. So what you have in, 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 in Bangalore is a showpiece of the benign effects of globalization, where globalization has <coughs> uh, taken advantage of a skilled, educated workforce. It has generated income, created a middle class, and also spawned as a happy byproduct a wave of new philanthropy. So in my hometown, Bangalore, are some outstanding philanthropists, you know, sort of, uh, uh, quasi or mini Bill Gates like figures you know, who have uh, people from a modest middle class background who are successful entrepreneurs who run big IT companies and have then uh, invested their wealth in uh, or uh, donated their wealth in the promotion of primary education, health care for the poor uh, and so on and so forth. So that's the benign side of globalization. But there's also a brutal side and the brutal side of globalization is played out uh, is being played out in central India uh, in the homelands of the tribal people. About 8% of India is tribal. <coughs> uh, so they're kind of outside the Hindu caste order, if you will. Uh, uh, and uh, they have lived among India's finest forests, alongside India's fastest flowing rivers. And now on, uh, it's found that they live on top of India's most precious resources of bauxite and iron ore. And uh, the fact that India is open now to the global economy, which includes not just the West but China, has generated a new market for these mineral resources. And the rush to make profits <coughs> by Indian and foreign companies has led to the dispossession of these tribal people. And that's at the root of the Maoist insurgency, which is a serious challenge to Indian democracy. It's a challenge to the Indian model of economic growth. Uh, uh, it shows it up for, uh, as uh, partial and one-sided. And it also uh, is a challenge to Indian democracy because Indian democracy has <coughs> done a moderately good job, not a perfect job, but a moderately good job of giving representation to religious minorities. Despite the provocation of being surrounded by Islamic states, 
we are not a Hindu nation. We are a multi-religious secular nation. Uh, uh, despite a history of the most uh, uh, gross oppression of women, uh, I mean, you know, legitimized by a patriarchal religious order, women have equal rights under the Indian constitution. Despite uh, in inequities and hierarchical caste system, they are vigorous programs of affirmative action for low caste. But the tribals have been excluded from the formal democratic process. They are, in some ways, the people who have gained least and lost most from six decades of democracy and development in India. And they, uh, 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 the fact that the formal constitutional democratic political system has not given the tribal people an adequate voice, the added fact that economic globalization has led to economic deprivation for the tribal people has de delivered them into the waiting hands of the Maoist revolutionaries, uh, whose political program uh, I personally have no sympathy with, uh, though I can see why they are successful, because uh, apart from uh, uh, the deprivation of the tribal people, uh, the tribals live in the hills and forests, which are classically, uh, perfectly well suited for the kind of guerrilla warfare that the Maoists practice. So that's a major challenge, uh, a challenge that is uh, much underappreciated within India too. Uh, you know, I live in Bangalore, which is the economic showpiece of modern India. Uh, my friend David Malone was <coughs> uh, posted as Canada's distinguished high commissioner in Delhi. Uh, which is the political showpiece of modern India. It's a city I visit uh, often my, myself. And if you fly from Delhi to Bangalore and back, from uh, uh, the capital of India's thriving and robust democracy to the capital of India's, uh, or, or to the showpiece of India's economic surge, below you on the ground, 35,000 feet below you on the ground, invisible to you, is this civil war being played out between Maoist insurgents and uh, uh, the Indian police with the tribals caught in the crossfire. Now, <coughs> that's one major challenge facing contemporary India, the political and economic system of contemporary India. It's a challenge from the left. But there's a simultaneous challenge from the right. And the challenge from the right is that of religious fundamentalism. <coughs> now, um, India was constituted in 1947, as I said, as a secular nation. But India was divided at birth into two nations, Pakistan, which was a Muslim homeland, and later on has become an Islamic republic. And so long as Pakistan exists, there will be provocations uh, for Hindu fundamentalists in India to constitute uh, similarly constitute a state based on religious principles, a kind of Hindu Pakistan, if you will, in which in Pakistan, non-Muslims have secondary rights. They don't have equal rights to Muslims. So there is an uh, impetus uh, that the uh, existence of Pakistan provides for right-wing radical Hindu groups to constitute India as a state in which Hindus, which are, who are the dominant religion, will have dominant religious community, will have uh, superior rights to Muslims and Christians and Parsis and Sikhs and Jains and so on. Now this provocation has been was resisted at birth by our first and visionary Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, who working in the tradition of Mahatma Gandhi did not discriminate on the basis of faith. But over the years or over the decades, the secular, inclusive, plural, prince, uh, plural religious politics of Gandhi and Nehru has been challenged by aggressive right-wing Hindu fundamentalism, uh, sometimes with success, sometimes with less success. Between 1998 and 2004, <coughs> the central government in India was led by a right-wing Hindu party. And uh, the assertion of Hindu radicalism provides a kind of uh, uh, provocation for competitive religious radicalism. So within all our faith communities, within the Christians, the Sikhs, the Muslims, even the Jains, there is a strong hardcore fundamentalist element. Within each of India's major religious communities, there is a battle going on between liberal, plural forces on the one side and intolerant fundamentalist forces on the other. And that's a challenge we have not yet fully overcome. I mean, unlike, say, uh, in Canada <coughs> or in many other countries in Western Europe and North America, uh, where 
religious practice uh, is a private matter between uh, an individual and his or her maker or lack thereof. In India, religious practice, religious beliefs spill over into the political domain, uh, sometimes in deeply unpleasant and damaging and costly and bloody ways. Now, as it happens, when India was born in 1947, it faced these two challenges. A challenge from the religious right, most dramatically expressed in the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi uh, five months after Indian independence by a Hindu fanatic. But there was also a challenge from the left. Six weeks after Gandhi was murdered, the Communist Party of India, acting uh, under orders from their Soviet masters, uh, launched a countrywide insurrection against the Indian, infant Indian state. And that insurrection took two and a half years to contain. The threat from the religious right and the simultaneous threat from the political left, uh, which um, India experienced at its birth, was tamed and contained and managed because the center was resolute, because the first generation of Indian nationalists, people like Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, Vallabhai Patel, who was India's home minister, a very capable and uh, outstanding uh, organi organizer, our first law minister, who came from an untouchable background, B. R. Ambedkar, who drafted the democratic and republican Indian constitution. This first generation of Indian politicians made sure that the center held firm, uh, that the challenges of religious radicalism on the right and of political extremism Marxist insurgency on the left uh, were combated, uh, were conquered, uh, were domesticated, and a democratic constitution was forged in 1950, and our first elections were held in 1952. Now, 60 years later, <coughs> the democratic center faces again a challenge from the left and a from the extreme left and from the extreme right, from, so to say, the non constitutional or extra constitutional left and the extra constitutional right. But unlike in 1948 and 49, we do not have a resolute and capable center. Um, today in India, most political parties are family firms. This is true most obviously of the Congress Party. The Congress Party uh, uh, is one of the great political parties of the modern world. Now, most Indians who are alive now uh, only know it as a family firm. Uh, because most Indians uh, are below the age of 40. And the Congress has been a family firm since 1975 or thereabouts. But for 90 years before that, it was an extraordinary institution. Uh, the Congress from the late 19th century through uh, uh, the first uh, decades of the 20th century united a diverse and disparate population around uh, uh, a democratic, inclusive, secular agenda. It was the Congress that provided uh, the first generation of nation builders in independent India. For most of its history, the Congress was run the way a modern political party should be run, as an open secular institution, uh, it, which any talented individual could join, uh, which held regular elections at different levels of the organization. So the Congress had national elections, it had provincial elections, it had district elections. But Indira Gandhi, who became uh, prime minister more or less by accident in, in the late 1960s, converted the Congress into a family firm. And it's a family firm today. Uh, and the two aspects of uh, the conversion of the Congress from an open, secular institution to a family firm that bear emphasizing. The first uh, <coughs> uh, consequence is that because India's greatest political party was converted into a family firm, other political parties were given uh, the incentive to do the same thing. So that, for example, uh, in the state of uh, Tamil Nadu in South India, uh, the major political party, the DMK, was a social democratic party with a great emphasis on gender equality and social welfare measures for the poor. The now uh, uh, widely hailed program of midday meals, uh, for example, in Indian schools, whereby the state provides a hot meal uh, for every student, especially girl students, uh, thus providing an incentive uh, 
uh, to promote female education was promoted by the DNK. But the DNK now exists so that the man in power, Karunadiri is his name, will pass on his mantle as Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu to his son, who bears the curious name of Stalin. He's called M.K. Stalin, by the way. <laughs> now, this is one of now, that's in the south of India. <coughs> Move to the north and in the state of Punjab, which, has, uh, uh, which is dominated by a party called the Akali Dal, which, like the DMK, was a progressive reformist party of the Sikhs, uh, which, in the, which arose in the 1920s uh, as a challenge to a corrupt and decadent clergy, which then controlled the Sikh Gurdwaras and the Sikh faith. So it is a party with an honorable tradition of democratic affirmation. The Akali Dal today is controlled by a single family called the Badals. Now, that's the first consequence of the conversion of the Congress into a family firm. You know, if uh, uh, the, star, the, 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 the most brightly lit star in the uh, uh, sky, you know, uh, succumbs to this kind of nepotistic politics, so will the lesser parties. The second consequence is that public appointments are <coughs> increasingly decided on the basis of kinship, nepotism, and sycophancy. And this brings me uh, from the decline of the Indian political party to the decline of Indian public institutions. In my lifetime, uh, I was born in the late 1950s, so in my lifetime, I've seen a visible decline in the capability, efficiency, integrity, honesty of <coughs> public hospitals, public schools, uh, uh, public courts, public universities, and so on and so forth, largely because uh, modern institutions such as hospitals and courts and universities, which need to be run on impersonal principles, have become increasingly captive in the Indian system to kinship, family, caste, and religion. Now, <coughs> this... Uh, decline of public institutions, uh, this corruption and corrosion of uh, the democratic political process, in my view, is partly or even largely responsible uh, for one uh, rather striking feature of modern India, which is the growing gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, I myself uh, would probably call, uh, you know, Politically, I'm somewhere in the center, slightly to the left of center. You know, not very much to the left of center, maybe one or half degree to the left of center, uh, if, if that. Uh, so I see uh, uh, a very important role for the market. I think it's very important. Uh, it's, it's good that in the 1990s we opened out the economy, that we unleashed the entrepreneurial energies uh, of the Indian innovator and businessman. But I also believe that while it's a utopian fantasy, you think that any society uh, can achieve equality of result. All modern democratic states must strive to the extent possible to achieve equality of opportunity. Uh, that they must have decent uh, health care and education systems so that even the poor have an equal chance. Now, in the kind of, con in the kind of situation I've described, where you have um, uh, the decline of public institutions, you, you have a surge of economic growth over the last 10 or 15 years, which has created a large middle class, but hasn't really addressed the problems of endemic and mass poverty. Now, and these contrasts are visible in any Indian city. <coughs> They're even more visible if you travel out of the city into the countryside. So I think the growing gap between the rich and the poor uh, is a major problem and challenge facing <coughs> India today. There's another problem uh, which uh, requires, I think, uh, which the market can't solve, and that's the problem of environmental degradation. And I'm not talking climate change here. You know, I think uh, there's a very vigorous uh, debate about India's responsibilities on the global stage as regards climate change. And, uh, you know, you're all familiar with that debate. You know the position of... Uh, it's a debate polarized between the early polluters and the late polluters, if you will. Uh, 
And I don't want to get into that uh, because I think that's not really uh, what I uh, want, want to draw your attention to. I want to draw your attention to the fact that regardless of India's position in global negotiations, you know, uh, regardless of whether uh, it's uh, North America and Europe that bear the historic responsibility for the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and so on, Indians have to be much more proactive on the environmental front because of the abuse of the environment within India itself. Indian cities uh, have the highest rates of air pollution in the world, which may be another reason I suffer from laryngitis apart from too much bullshitting. Uh, <coughs> but uh, that's only one side or one, one aspect of the way in which the surge in economic growth has damaged the Indian environment. Uh, our rivers are dead. Uh, uh, historically, uh, as in most great agrarian civilizations, the cities came up on waterways. Delhi on the Jamuna, Banaras on the, <coughs> on the Ganga, um, uh, Guwahati on the Brahmaputra, and so on. But these rivers are dead because of industrial pollution and uh, domestic sewage. Um, there's been a massive depletion of groundwater aquifers uh, because of commercial farming. There's been a great loss of biodiversity, not just of spectacular animals such as the tiger, but also of bird life, of plant diversity. Uh, we have a serious problem of, uh, related to the disposal of chemical waste. Now, so India uh, is in many ways uh, an environmental basket case. Regardless of our position on climate change, uh, uh, we, uh, the, the processes of economic growth in India uh, and the apathy of the state in monitoring, controlling, um, uh, moderating the negative aspects of this process of economic growth has led to widespread and varied forms of environmental degradation from uh, very high and intolerable rates of air and water pollution to, uh, 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 to the depletion of groundwater aquifers, uh, to the death of rivers, and so to the decline of biodiversity, and so on and so forth. Now, when you think of <coughs> how to tackle environmental degradation. Clearly, you need public action, uh, as with how to tackle uh, very high rates of inequality. And apart from the state, <coughs> uh, a key actor here should be the media. Now, unfortunately, uh, one of the, uh, while India is not China, and Google can operate freely in India, uh, unlike in China, uh, while we do have an active and free press, we also have a press that is somewhat one-sided, a press that is uh, uh, increasingly taken up with a kind of worship of glamour and celebrity, rather than look at the entire diversity of social and environmental uh, issues in India today. So, uh, <coughs> for example, more people will cover a beauty contest than agrarian distress. Uh, the environment. Uh, we had a very active environmental journalistic tradition. Uh, one of the great pioneers was a man called Anil Agarwal, the late Anil Agarwal, uh, who founded the Center for Science and Environment in New Delhi, and who published in the early 1980s annual reports on the Indian environment. They were called Citizens' Reports on the Indian Environment, and they documented extensively how we were using and abusing our forest, water, air, uh, mineral resources. However, uh, when we embraced an outward-looking economic policy in the 1990s, environmental reportage went by the wayside. Uh, every newspaper either laid off its environmental correspondents or redesignated them stock market correspondents. So the Indian media, which should be vigilant about these matters, which should really be focusing um, uh, in a much more systematic way the attention of the citizen citizenry of public policy uh, on environmental degradation, I think, is playing a less than optimum role. Adding to our challenges is the fragmentation of the political system. <coughs> uh, you know, India is probably too diverse, too large, too diverse, too complicated to be le uh, to be run uh, on the classical European model of uh, a two-party democracy. 
I think Canada is uh, finding it difficult, and India is much larger and much more diverse than Canada. So it's no surprise, perhaps, that in the ruling coalition in New Delhi, you may have 16 or 18 parties represented. Now, this <coughs> diversity of political parties uh, is both rational and irrational. It's a just and fair representation of the diversity, the social and cultural and political diversity of India. Uh, it's linguistic, uh, ethnic, religious diversity. But at the same time, you can't have long-term, uh, uh, good, long-term, robust policies uh, in an 18-party government. And in India particularly, you can't have honest governance either. Uh, uh, when uh, a new coalition comes to power after a general election in India, for the last 20 years we've had about six or seven general elections, uh, and the last uh, time a single party achieved a ma majority was in 1984. So we've had 1989, 1991, 96, 98, 99, 2004, 2009. That's seven general elections. Each time, typically, and <coughs> you Canadians uh, would be familiar with one side of the story, not the other side of the story, which I'm going to come to, uh, you, you find that uh, you need 272 seats to uh, have a majority in parliament. So one major party, say the Congress party, has about 160 seats. So it needs about 100. And how does it get its 100? It goes shopping for allies. And usually, uh, if you add 6 and 8 and 10 and 12 seats, you end up with a 15-party coalition. And you cross that magic number of 272. Now, that's a procedure which many uh, uh, democracies uh, uh, are familiar with. Uh, in Europe too, for example, in, in Germany you have always have a problem where uh, the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats need to uh, cozy up to the Free Democrats or the Greens to, to, to form a ruling coalition. But where India is special is that uh, is in terms of the price of joining a coalition. Now in Germany, for example, I mean, since I know a little bit about Germany, you will probably find that the Greens, if they want to join a coalition, will say, give us the Environment Ministry. The Free Democrats, uh, because they uh, think that foreign policy is important or fashionable or uh, prestigious, will say, give us the foreign ministry. In India, the party uh, that is being wooed by the larger party will say, give us the ministry in which we can make the most money quickly. So <coughs> multi-party coalitions in India have led not just to political, uh, uh, not just led to political instability, uh, to the lack of uh, systematic uh, policies being formulated to tackle energy or health or education or the environment have also led to the intensification of corruption. Now, so we have a, a relatively, uh, we have a complicated and not entirely stable polity. We also have uh, parts of India that are not entirely comfortable with being, uh, 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 you know, Indian. Apart from the Maoist insurgency I mentioned, there are at least three states of the Indian Union, the state of Kashmir, which is disputed between India and Pakistan, and the states of Manipur and Nagaland in the northeast, where there are major insurgencies, where groups like with the Maoists, groups of committed young men and less often committed young women are fighting an armed struggle for independent homelands, for independent nations. <coughs> um, so you have disturbances in three states uh, in, in the borders, you also have a very unstable neighborhood. And I think uh, certainly much more unstable than uh, residents of this great country. I mean, you have the, you know, the peaceful, the cold admittedly, but the cold and the peaceful Arctic to the, the north of you. You have uh, this big behemoth to the south of you. You have the sea on two sides. Who do we have? We have on our west, Pakistan somewhere between an Islamic theocracy and a failed state. Uh, 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 you know, uh, move up towards the north, you have China, uh, with whom we fought a bloody war uh, in 1962, and we have border issues that are unresolved. Come far south, and you have Sri Lanka, which has had a brutal civil war, which has claimed 100,000 people. And despite the apparent military success of the current regime, it's a civil war that hasn't really addressed the underlying problems that caused the conflict in the first place. Move east, <coughs> you have Bangladesh, uh, which has a very fragile democracy, 
move northeast. Uh, uh, north, uh, you have Nepal, uh, where you had a Maoist insurgency, which is ha hasn't really found a soft landing. Uh, uh, you know, where the democratic process is still quite fragile and unresolved. Now, what I've done so far uh, is to uh, itemize, uh, and I'll recapitulate these points. Itemize uh, what. Uh, not the multitude of sins, but the multitude of problems that those aggregate statistics about India's apparent economic and political success conceal. And let me repeat these 10 points. The 10 reasons India will not be a superpower are, first, the challenge of left-wing political extremism, the Maoist insurgency in the heart of India. Second, the, uh, the still... <coughs> Uh, very visible tendency towards fundament fundamentalist uh, assertion in all India's faith communities and particularly in India's majority Hindu faith community. Third, the decline of the political center, particularly the conversion of political parties into family firms. Fourth, the corruption and corrosion of public institutions. Fifth, the growing gap between the rich and the poor. Sixth, the rapid pace of environmental degradation. Seven, the apathy of the media. Eight, uh, the political fragmentation and the policy incoherence it gives birth to. Ninth, the uh, disturbances in the Northeast and the Northwest, in Kashmir, Manipur, and Nagaland. And finally, a very unstable neighborhood. Now, there are 10 reasons uh, India, I believe, will not be a superpower. But to this, uh, analytical uh, uh, listing of problems that the country faces, I'd like to add a citizen's uh, desire that India should not even aspire to be a superpower. In my view, uh, <coughs> international relations is not a 100-meter race, you know, where someone must come first and someone must come last. Uh, in my view, uh, if you look at what the 20th century, or indeed the last 200 years have taught you, is that uh, there are no permanent winners and losers in history. Uh, you know, the British had to cope with decline. The Soviet Union coped very badly with decline. We really don't know how the Americans will cope with decline. And maybe we, sh we Indians should never be in that position in the first place. By arguing thus, I am not promoting either an isolationism or some kind of Gandhian pacifism. I believe that India has to be vigilant in protecting its borders. It has to have a capable and efficient and well-funded army. It has, had to, has to have a much better security and intelligence gathering system than it has at present to tackle particularly the threats of right-wing and left-wing extremism and terrorism. So I'm not a Gandhian pacifist, nor am I an isolationist. I think uh, there are things India could teach the world, uh, which are different from what uh, some uh, of my fellow compatriots think India should be teaching the world. I mean, um, I think the desire for superstar, uh, for super pardon comes from a kind of male anxiety. Uh, it's expressed uh, most visibly in my country by three kinds of men. Uh, businessmen, male editors of newspapers, <laughs> and male politicians in New Delhi, who uh, would like to be treated, uh, you know, the male editors would be like to be treated the way the editor of the New York Times is or maybe 10 years later, the uh, editor of the People's Daily of Beijing will be, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, the businessman and so on. Now, I think uh, it comes from a kind of uh, status anxiety. I think what India, uh, and they would like to strut around, uh, you know, the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, you know, other corridors of global power and influence making in the way in which Americans have become accustomed to, in which the Chinese apparently are now becoming accustomed to, and ways in which the British and the Russians and the French used to strut around uh, in the past. Now, I think what India can teach the world, I mean, I think, uh, really, I'm saying two or three things. The first thing I'm saying is that we have serious fault lines and divisions within Indian society. And we really need to refocus our attention on these. The second thing I'm saying is that what is unique about India is its political experiment. The fact that we are so large and so diverse, yet a single nation. The fact that against the odds, despite poverty and illiteracy, we somehow constructed an electoral system based on 
individuals choosing the right to elect their own leaders. Uh, I think uh, <coughs> uh, when Europe, uh, which is finding great difficulty in dealing with its Muslim minority, they can possibly turn to how India has dealt not too badly with its Muslim minority. When uh, the Americans are paranoid about the growing Spanish speakers in their homeland, for example, they should see, consider how India uh, has, uh, you know, um, uh, has dealt wonderfully with uh, multilingualism. I mean, and forget, forget America. In 1956, and I'll end with this example. In 1956, the <coughs> Parliament of Ceylon, as Sri Lanka was then known, passed the Sinhala only language policy. It said from now on, on the European model, where a single nation must have a single language to bind the citizens in one kind of unified national purpose, Sinhala will be the only language of government administration and university education. And the Tamils of the North protested. They said, you know, this policy will, uh, you know, we have an ancient and beautiful language and we'll be discriminated against. And at that stage, in 1956, the same year, uh, India reorganized the map of India on linguistic grounds. So we, you know, we did what uh, Canada did, except that you have two languages. We have, you know, 16 or 18. And it happened in the same year, and in, uh, that Sri Lanka imposed one language as the official national language, and India allowed a diversity of languages to flourish. And there was a Sinhala MP uh, called Colvin de Souza, uh, uh, Colvin de Silva, who said in the Parliament, he 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 told the government, which was promoting a Sinhala only policy, he said. I warn you, <coughs> one language, two nations. Two languages, one nation. Well, in India, uh, we had Hindi zealots. You know, there was a slogan of the old right-wing party, the Jansang, Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan. He who is a hin Hindu, he who speaks Hindi, only he is a proper Indian. We would have had one language, 17 nations. Now, I think we're an extraordinary political experiment. Uh, it's an experiment that uh, hasn't completely succeeded. It's still finding its way. Uh, there are divisions and fissures within. But I think what we, uh, if at all, <coughs> uh, we have a lesson to the world, uh, it's not about domination. It's about coexistence. Thank you very much. Ram, uh, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Now, we have some time for questions, if you're willing. What I'm going to suggest is those wanting to ask one, come to one of the two microphones, um, identify yourselves, and ask your question or make your remark briefly, because that will allow others to make remarks or ask questions briefly. So, Ram, why don't you choose the two microphones are there and here. Um, if you find it easier to okay. see people standing up, that may work better for you. So you choose. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Safwat Ayub from the South North uh, Forum. Uh, Mr. Goha, you gave us, uh, uh, I must say, a very rich uh, presentation of uh, aspects we, we were uh, not aware of. Uh, why? Because uh, we see, like your press, the glamorous side of, of India. A few years ago, and Ambassador Malone uh, was in India, I think, at that time, Minister Kanwal of uh, Science and, uh, and Technology was here in Canada. And I can tell you that he, his agenda was full. Everybody wanted to see him. Everybody wanted to sign agreements with, uh, with uh, advanced India. I was a kid in Egypt when Jawahar Nal Nehru and Nasser formed together the non-alignment movement. And the Egyptians were looking always towards India. How come India has succeeded in producing a car 100%? How India could do all this? Uh, the disadvantages you mentioned, having uh, some prime ministers wanting their, their children to be their, uh, uh, succeed them. Well, we have in the, in the southern borders some examples of this sometime. And uh, we've seen it in many other places. I don't know if this has uh, 
been a handicap for India. Uh, what I wanted to say is that in Canada, for instance, I have a brother who went recently to recruit 500 engineers in your country to work for a Canadian <laughs> firm. It's five times cheaper and much better in quality. So this is how we see India here. Thank no, you. I think it's, you know, uh, 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 as I said, I, what I was trying to provide was a reality check. You know, the aspects of India's economic growth that are important. The engineers you talk about are what I call the benign side of globalization. Uh, the disposition of tribal people to greedily extract mineral uh, resources is not a happy thing. And I think India is large and diverse and complicated and uh, uh, different parts are, you know, are moving at a different momentum. And uh, 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 what I was really, you know, I, I'm a patriot. I mean, I, I would like my country to do well, uh, uh, to be just, uh, to lift his people out of poverty. Uh, uh, I am also a Democrat. I abhor uh, Maoist revolutionaries, uh, as I abhor right-wing Hindu extremists. But I'm not, um, uh, you know, I'm not one-eyed. I'm not blind, and I'm not a jingoist uh, trumpeter. You know, I mean, minister, and I'm not a minister. You know, I'm an independent intellectual. Well, so, it could yeah, be yeah, one so, so, so I have to say <laughs> what I see, and I see uh, these con conflicts and contradictions around me, uh, which uh, mm. are also as much the Indian story as the 500 engineers you mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. My name is Anu Bose, and my uh, roots are in Calcutta, which I won't say Kolkata, I will say Calcutta. I have a question for you. There is another fissure which I wish you had addressed, which is the question of the Dalits of India. I think as long as we have the question of untouchability in practice, if not in law, then it's going to hold India back very, very much. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, I mean, I listed 10, there could be 20 or 25 issues. I had to be picky. But I think uh, the tribal people are much worse off than the Dalits. I would put it this way, that um, uh, the Dalits, for example, have political representation. I mean, it's, it's a, uh, a Dalit woman is the chief minister of India's largest state. Dalits are visible, uh, uh, very visible in the intellectual community, uh, in the government, not yet in entrepreneurship. Uh, but uh, the untouchables, uh, you know, I could have added gender to my list, for example. But I think uh, those are issues which, over a period of time, India will, uh, will resolve. I think the Dalits, in 60 years, uh, we have made some progress compared to the past 6,000 years of oppression of Dalits. So I would not put it, I mean, I, I, I'm cognizant of it, and I'm aware of it, but I don't think it's as serious and fundamental a challenge. I think the procedures and processes of Indian democracy can take account of it. Uh, but they can't really take account of the tribal question or the question of the borderlands, the Nagas, the Manipuris, in the same way. Thank you. My name is Veena Ravichandran. I work with IDRC's Innovation Technology and Society Program. And I work predominantly in the South Asian region. And first of all, what a brilliant tapestry of uh, the Indian scenario, and uh, and I'm I'm delighted the way you brought out the the fault lines and the fissures underneath. I have very brief two questions about the religious right wing fundamentalism. You alluded to uh, within a particular region. You said that there are rifts within a community, a religious community, of extreme right wing and then moderate. And I wonder where that's coming from. Is it is it coming from uh, the rich poor gap, or is it education? What is the what is the uh, you know trigger for that kind of a split within a religious? The second <coughs> question. I'll finish my second. Uh, uh, do you see at all a visible um, coming forth of social entrepreneurship? Today we have at least five leading uh, business schools, the IITs, which are offering courses in social entrepreneurship. And there are, that means there is an appetite, there are young people, and so much um, you know, visible uprising of young people, youngsters who are educated, who consciously stay back and they want to do. Um, and this is seen in the number of non-government organizations, purely driven by passion to make a difference. Is there any hope at all? Or no, there is. I, I, I mean, these are both very important questions that would, you know, pro probably would require a much more extended discussion. I think the first question I'll answer very, very briefly. I think uh, you, have a, uh, you have a domestic situation uh, or a, a regional situation where you have the rise of Islamic fundamentalism in the region, you know, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, which is a provocation of Hindu fundamentalism. 
But there's also a global situation. I mean, uh, there's a conflict in the Middle East, you know, which is uh, aggressive Zionism versus, you know, equally aggressive uh, Islamism. I mean, you have the kind of evangelical fervor of a George Bush. So you have a kind of uh, global situation that, that feeds it. The other question, I think, uh, other issue was social entrepreneurship. If I was to look at uh, India, if I was to compare India in 1950 with India in 2010, I would uh, conceptually uh, do, uh, compare it like this. I would say for a democracy uh, and a welfare state to function at somewhere near op optimum capacity, you need three sectors to pull your weight. You need the state, you need the private entrepreneurs, and you need civil society. In the 50s and 60s, we had an efficient, capable, focused state. We had no NGO movement, and we had timid and insecure entrepreneurs. Today, uh, we have a thriving civil society movement. Uh, we have social entrepreneurs, but we also have, uh, on the other hand, some industrialists who are just incredibly greedy and you know, uncaring about uh, society as a whole. But we have really a malfunctioning state. So I mean, you need all three sectors. I mean, whether it be Sweden or Canada or anywhere else, you need civil society, state, and private sector. I mean, you need the entrepreneurial energy of the private sector. You need uh, uh, the mobilizing power and the collective solidarity of civil society organizations. And you need impart impartial, capably functioning fair state. And I think our public institutions are in a state of crisis. And, and that's what we really need to address. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Anil. I'm uh, here at the IDRC. Um, so your point about the extraordinariness of uh, the Indian political experiment is, is uh, quite right, I think, especially with the different fault lines that, that exist there. And the last part of your talk about uh, the lessons that, that other countries can learn from India is something that I think about a lot, because it seems like a lot of the problems that other countries have, there's some sort of analog that exists in India whether it's language or, or insurgency or separatist movements or whatever. But then again, um, and this, this question is very general, just to provoke some thought. I wonder, I'm wondering, however, if India is just too extraordinary to actually provide true lessons to other countries. Because it doesn't seem like other countries can really do what India has done. Well, to a limited extent. I think uh, you know, there's an example I like to give. And uh, David has heard this before, so he'll uh, crave my indulgence. And it's due with, for example, uh, the handling of uh, ethnic diversity. Uh, you know, uh, four years ago, when the French were beating the head about the headscarf, uh, I gave a talk in a university in Kerala, in a Muslim majority district in Kerala. I mean, it's the, un it's, it's the district of Malappuram, previously known as Calicut, which is the, uh, one of the few Muslim majority districts in India outside the Kashmir Valley. And it was a talk to an audience like this in a university. And at least 40% of the audience were young girls in headscarves. And the headscarf was liberating. It allowed them to come to university and acquire a university education. Now, there's a clear difference between a headscarf and a veil, and a full veil. Now, the Indians live with accommodation. I mean, we don't mind. I mean, a Sikh wears a turban. A Hindu peasant wears a turban. A, a Hindu woman covers a head with a you know, scarf. I mean, the French would be saying, what the hell are you doing? I mean, my wife and sometimes she covers. I mean, they, they might be. So I think there are some things like this, or linguistic diversity, I think, uh, is another lesson uh, that the Sri Lankans could have learned from us. They still could. I mean, you know, talk about Sri Lanka. The Sri Lankan crisis has two elements. First, uh, the imposition of Sinhala on the Tamils. Second, the fact that in 1972, Buddhism was made the official state religion. Unfortunately, <coughs> I mean, the LTT, uh, the Tamil Tigers, were a brutal fascist organization. And I'm glad they're finished. But at the same time, the kind of triumphalism of the Sinhala elite today is not going to restore peace and trust in, in the northern parts of Sri Lanka. That can only come uh, by a gesture such as, uh, such as giving Tamil equal rights or saying there is no equation of faith with state. Sri Lanka is not a Buddhist nation. It is for everyone. So I think there are things about the Indian experiment. I mean, our scale is staggering. I agree. I mean, our scale is staggering. And uh, uh, I often say that <coughs> uh, it's probably um, you know, only the Soviet Union and uh, the USA, which, have, you know, which are national uh, experiments comparable in scale. So in that sense, yes. But I think there's certain limited lessons. Uh, but at the same time, we could learn lessons from other countries. You know, I think that the reciprocity is important. I mean, we could learn uh, 
how to deconvert political parties into open secular institutions, you know, uh, to limit the influence of kin and nepotism on, uh, 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 you know, in the way in which uh, other institutions function. So I think, um, uh, uh, I think the boring can be both ways. Thanks, Ram. I think we'll take, uh, mindful of your voice amongst <laughs> other factors. We'll just take the two people who are still standing, and then we'll draw it to a close. You all know there's some coffee and tea outside, some cookies, so I hope we can all get together over those. And I'm sure Ram will stay for a few minutes to speak to people. Thank you. My name is Christina Marcott. I actually work in aerospace and industry Canada, and here out of personal interest, having been a student of India in my undergraduate degree. Um, you're speak I've heard India referred to as more of a status quo power rather than a superpower. I was wondering, though, in your opinion, if India may end up a superpower in spite of itself. With the continued economic growth, I know the Indian Army is now looking at acquiring some new capabilities, that given the right circumstances, India may decide to intervene in something because they feel they have to, which is what I mean by sort of maybe they don't consciously decide to be a superpower but may end up in that role anyway. Well, it's hard to say. I mean, you can't say what the circumstances would be. Uh, in 1987, we intervened in Sri Lanka and got a bloody nose. I mean, Indian Army, uh, I think that's a mistake. Uh, status quo power would be about it. I, I, the, the, the phrase I prefer to either status quo power or super power is not of my coinage. Uh, uh, it's uh, the coinage of uh, my colleague Sunil Khilani. And he calls India a bridging power. You know, India is, because of its history, its culture, its diversity, it's uniquely placed to bridge uh, the West and the East, Asia and Europe, uh, democracy and totalitarianism, if you wish. You know, I think that's, that's how I would uh, like to see it. Not status quo is too negative. Superpower is too uh, triumphalist, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you know what I mean. I think bridging power is kind of where, where I would see it. Yeah. 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 My name is Purvi. I'm an intern here at IDRC. Um, you mentioned the crisis of governance and, and the decline of public institutions in India. One phenomenon that I see is stemming from that is the extreme activism of Indian courts. There seems to be other institutions in India that are completely failing, not being able to provide goods and services, and the courts have taken on this role for themselves where they're stepping in to fill that vacuum. Mostly the executive, sometimes the legislature as well. Um, it could be a good thing in that the job gets done, somebody's doing it. It could be a bad thing in that it raises lots of questions of legitimacy, it's not a democratic institution, especially in India, the judiciary is not a democratic institution at all. Um, I just want to get your thoughts on yeah. whether that should be looked at as a good thing or a bad thing. I think uh, uh, you're right. Uh, 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 I mean, let me put it this way, that the period of activism or hyperactivism of the Indian courts has passed its peak. It was 10 or 15 years ago. And now I think the courts are less willing. Uh, on balance, I, like you, I have ambivalent feelings about activism uh, because it's going into areas where sometimes they don't have the competence. And I think one of the problems of the Indian court, I mean, so far, fortunately, uh, the, Indian, the higher levels of the Indian judiciary are, ha, are relatively free from corruption. There are a few corrupt judges, but the proportion of corrupt judges uh, is much smaller than the uh, proportion of corrupt politicians or indeed corrupt civil servants or possibly even corrupt newspaper editors. You know, I could even say that. You know, you know if, you, if you have a large, large uh, uh, you know, a definition of uh, corruption which is broad. So I think that's a good part of the, but where we, where we uh, and David knows this subject uh, probably better than me, I think what we don't have is a sufficiently educated judiciary. You know, uh, we live in a very complex world, uh, so that how to deal with the genetic modification of crops, how to deal with new kinds of surveillance systems, the technology of those. You know, the Indian judiciary is born omniscient. You know, you're, you're, you, you join the judiciary at 40, and who knows, I mean, uh, they think they know everything, so they, uh, r they, you know, what they need is regular refresher courses. You know, the judges, but the judges don't think, uh, the lordships don't think that they can actually go and be educated. So I think, and also uh, because there's now increasing political interference in the recruitment of judges, the quality of the Indian judiciary, uh, I think, is also declining. I mean, we had outstanding judges, and uh, more than the activism, I would be worried about uh, the quality and the, and the, it's the sheer intellectual power of the Indian judiciary, which I think is now uh, not what it used to be. Ram, thank you. On that point, I once saw a wonderful sight in Bhutan about two years ago. As many of you will know, Bhutan got a new constitution about three years ago, uh, which transforms it from an absolute monarchy into a constitutional one. 
I went to call on the Chief Justice, and what did I see? I saw the Chief Justice with every last judge of Bhutan in a classroom learning the new constitution. It was an admirable sight that uh, I think of uh, a demonstration of humility that many of the rest of us could learn from. Um, Ram, you, your presentation was terrific. I know people will have other questions for you uh, privately. Thank you so much for joining us. And all of us, I think, want to thank you for being here today.